Guys, thanks so much for being here. So um, very quickly about my background. I was actually a portfolio company. I was in the first fund. Back in the early days, I just actually popped out of my PhD. And instead of being an academic, I decided to go found a company. I found a company called Nasira. Did that for five years. That was acquired by VMware. It was in the enterprise space. Ran that business up to about a billion dollar run rate business. So like the last nine years of my life have been kind of that saga. And I think this, you know, this is meant to be an instructive deck, but in many ways it's kind of like almost like a story of my failures, which is I find coming from a technical background, it's a very non-intuitive, a lot of the kind of the business and marketing side. So I just wanted to let you know, this is not about blocking and tackling. This is not a business course. This is like as a technical founder in a market category creation scenario, kind of what are my lessons learned and what like if I would have gone back, I would have done very differently. And when I mean by market category creation, like when we started Nasira, for example, the concept didn't even exist, right? There was like no idea. Like, like, like we, we, we built this thing and nobody even knew how to think about it. Gartner didn't know how to talk about it. it there was no budget. There was no line item, and right? And so you see a market mature over many years. That's a very different motion than we're typically meant to do. And I think actually one of the biggest logical fallacies that technical founders do is the following. Is they think that if you create a widget, it has intrinsic value. And anybody that runs across that widget will be able to not only understand how cool it is, but like the dollar of value attached to it. The reality is that no matter how cool your widget is, especially in the enterprise space, until you go through go to market, it's like it doesn't even exist. Like nobody's gonna come and buy it. And like, of course, like all talks have cliches, but the biggest cliche around this is like, most material on go to market that you'll find in the general literature is around mature markets where you do things like market research and you know how to do pricing and you know how to do comparative analysis and all of this other stuff. And none of that applies in market category creating scenarios because nobody knows but you. Okay, so let's say that you do this. You have like this moment of inception, this abiogenesis, like out of nowhere you've created this thing, this new thing that's only yours. Now, how do you take that to market and get people to understand it and value it and sell it and everything else? So let me just start by why this is important really quickly. So it turns out, at least in the enterprise space, pretty much all of the value of a company comes down to go to market. And this is very not intuitive to me to begin with, but go to market is at least as important as technology. And if you want like a very simple mental model of why that is, it's the following. So over time, R&D becomes kind of a fixed cost or at least a sublinear cost, right? It's R&D, right? It's not going to scale with the number of customers. That's not the case with sales. And in most market category creation situations, in most of them, you have to have a warm body in the customer selling just because the customer doesn't even know how to think about it. So you, in most of cases, you have a direct sales model. And those, that direct sales is going to by far dwarf your cost. It becomes all of your variable cost. And that will become your margin. And that will set your valuation. So what I'm going to talk about, like the decisions I'm going to talk about are pretty much the key decisions that will impact the valuation of your company more than any other decisions that you make independent of how good the technology is. So first off, how do you know if you're in a market category creation situation? If you're developing new technology, sometimes it's the case that you're actually entering an existing market. Let's say you make a hard drive that stores more information, or you make a router that's faster or something like that. And in this case, this isn't market category creation because the customer actually knows what you're talking about, they know how to buy it, and you've got these very clear metrics. And in which case, this probably doesn't apply to you. Market category creation is the customers don't even understand the technical concepts, they don't understand the approach. In many cases, they don't even know they have a problem. It's very difficult to sell somebody something, but they don't even know a problem exists because not only do you have to educate them like your technical solution isn't snake oil, you actually have to educate them that like the way they're doing things doesn't work. And in some ways, it's very difficult to do that without calling the baby ugly, right? I mean, you're like, well, listen, what you're doing is not right, and I've got this thing that's a little bit better, and you've never heard of it before, and so forth. So if you feel like you're going to market and you're having hard customer conversations, and like they don't really understand what you're talking about, and like you know that there's something there, but they don't really see it, you may be in a market category creating scenario. If you're going and you're saying, here's you know, widget X and mine's better for these things, you probably aren't. And like, good for you. I think it's much easier in, in that situation. Okay, so what do we mean by go to market? So here are like the classics that you get in business school. There's pricing, promotion, marketing, placement, positioning. I'm gonna focus on pricing, marketing, and sales. So I'm gonna focus on the first three. So Ben Horowitz was on my board. I remember early on, you know, we were thinking about pricing, and I remember very, very clear, and I didn't understand until much, much later how true this is, that there's no single decision, at least in enterprise, there's no single decision you'll make that is more important than pricing with respect to your valuation, not a single one. And the reason is, like I said before, all of your contribution margin comes from 
basically how much you can sell your stuff for minus your cost of sales. That's the valuation of your company. And the ACV, and I'm going to talk more about this later, that annual contract value is directly correlated to your pricing. So if, for example, early on you set your price too low, you'll basically cannibalize your entire future market, and it's very difficult to raise price. So then there's this open question, and I'm going to give you my experience, but they're anecdotal. Of like, how do you set price when no market exists and nobody knows how to value whatever you're doing? So first, a caution. I think, and now I've seen this across probably 10 companies where I'm on the portfolio of the company. I think one of the, say, the second biggest mistake that I say technical entrepreneurs do is there's this assumption, because we're technologists, that the hard part is distribution and not value. And this was a mistake that I did. What we do is we optimize product entry so that we'll get it to as many people as possible at the risk of price. Because we assume, because we're technologists, we assume that we can innovate And on top of that, innovate, we can upsell. So often, our intuition is like, you set a price low, a lot of people will use it, then I'll have account control and traction, and then I can use that as a leverage point to make more money. In almost every case that we've studied, that I'm familiar with, that I've done, that's actually not what's going on. If you're having a hard time selling something, it's almost never priced early on. It's the market's not ready, or you actually don't have product market fit, or you don't have the right sales model. We often make this assumption that you have to price really low or you don't enter the market at all. And many cases will show this is false. So you've got this task, which is, okay, you created widget X. You're trying to bring it to market. You know you need to set the right price because you get that wrong, you basically screwed your company. So the question is, what is the right price to set it at? The way that you normally would think about this is, oh, we're going to go ahead and go to market and we're going to find comps and find what they'll be able to pay and whatever else. And the reality is, is that you almost have to work at it backwards, which is like, what sort of sales model can you do? And then what sort of price will affect that sales model? So it turns out certain price will support certain sales models and other prices won't. So for example, in most enterprise market category creation scenarios, you have to do direct sales. I'm just going to pick on this one as an example. So direct sales means that you're paying a sales rep. Now market prices, OTE for sales reps is what? 300K a year. So what can a sales rep, like how many deals can they normally close in a year? My experience, max 10, average around six, which is the maximum they'll be able to bring in if you give them 100K is $600,000 a year. This is a natural law of physics. If you're doing a direct sales model, which means now your margin is what, 50%? If you're doing 300,000 OT. There's these natural laws when you're pricing of what sort of direct sales model and what sort of margin model that you're going to be able to do. If you identify, listen, we have to do direct sales because you know, this is only applicable to the Fortune 2000. And this is a market category creation situation, so we have to have like kind of the deep conversation and it has to be evangelical sale. If your ACV isn't actually probably higher than that, 150,000, it's unlikely you'll have a viable company. Full stop. And by the way, if you set it too low initially, it's very difficult to raise it. So inside sales is when you have people dialing on the phone calls. We're actually starting to see a lot of success, even in market category creation scenarios, where you actually are using inside sales But what's interesting is actually revenue is still correlated more to direct sales. So it's almost like this is to bootstrap a sales function, and then you'll see companies, and I'll talk about this more on the sales side. So even if you, for example, say, listen, we're going to start an inside sales model, so I'm fine with a low ACV. I'm telling you, the majority of companies I talk to, that's their intuition. What they do is they kind of run into this wall where they basically trained the market. So the market has never thought about your thing before. Now you've trained them on this, like, it's only worth 40 k you know, and you've done that for two years. Now the market values your new thing at 40K. And now you're trying to do, build a direct sales model. It's very, very difficult because you just cannibalize yourself up front. So if I were you, I'd think very deeply about, okay, what can you price versus what sales model that you need? And listen, you can experiment a lot early on, but you can't experiment too much. An entrepreneur basically has two challenges in market category creation situations. Challenge number one is like you have to create a concept. Like your consistency, they wake up in the morning, they think about all sorts of stuff, but they don't think about your thing because it didn't exist. So you created it. Now the first thing you got to do is get them to think about your thing, right? It's like the Leonardo DiCaprio inception, right? Like, okay, so now they think about your thing, step one. But step two is you have to attach a value to that thing. Things in people's brains don't have intrinsic value. This is a conversation. This is a transaction that these things happen. I would strongly recommend that you do a lot of this work up front to understand the natural law of organizational (laughs) physics around pricing and around sales before you start cementing that dollar value on that thing in somebody's head. 
Okay, so just some basic considerations. I'm talking a lot about think a whole bunch before you do pricing and so forth. Some people take that really to heart and then they come back and they, they have these like unbelievably complex pricing model for a pipsqueak for a person startup. So that's not what I mean at all. Focus on the high order bit, right? The high order bit here is what ACV do you need to drive the sales that you need to mature your market? That's the high order bit. What that actually looks like to the customer in the negotiation doesn't matter. Like a lot of times I think startups try to look a lot more mature than they are. And so they've got, here's my 50 pricing models. And, you know, we've got like five different consumption paradigms. And, you know, you can have as a service, you can install or whatever. In the very beginning, I would keep it very, very simple. I would tag the price very high. It's very seductive to think about bundling with a more mature product. Never do that. And the reason you never want to do that is often we were like, oh, like there's this big product, let's say it's Windows. And if I'm bundled in Windows, it solves my distribution problem. I'm done, right? Problem is if you draft on another buying motion, then the people are buying that other thing and they don't care about your thing. So Microsoft is notorious for making multiple billion dollar businesses of basically shelfware because the consumption behavior didn't change and the consumer behavior didn't change. Price however you can, make sure it's an independent SKU and an independent sales motion. Don't bundle it with a more mature thing unless you, know, you want to drive revenue without actual use. And in my experience, be very careful about skewing. And by skewing, I mean offering different price points with different feature sets. Now, if you've done it before and you're comfortable with it and it's a mature market, that's fine. In my experience, you want to anchor high because it's very difficult to go high. And then once you start skewing, your mental model should be market expansion, net cannibalization. I mean, that's the, that's the only reason why you want to skew. But markets are really good at finding lowest price points. <laughs> so like you're, you start becoming your worst enemy as soon as you start doing that. So your life will be much easier if you resist doing that for a while. Let me talk a little bit about discounting. This comes from the enterprise buyer perspective. So one thing that salespeople are phenomenal at is actually understanding the procurement process. So it's kind of this very kind of Baroque tribal thing that happens. It's almost like this dance that you do. And different enterprises have different buying behaviors. But almost all of them, and all the ones that I've dealt with, I mean, like, I've probably spent 80% of the, my time in the field in the last five years, you know, you have your technical discussion, your technical sale, and then you get kicked over to procurement. And then these guys are actually comped on discounts, right? And so there's an expectation for discount on the back end. And many of the large vendors will do things like 90-point discounts, 70-point discounts, 60-point discounts, or, or whatever they're doing on the back end. Whatever pricing that you have, expect there to be discounting on the back end. If it's in the early days and you're worried about price erosion, it's good to anchor that on something of value. You're an early customer, so we're doing this, or things like that. If you can get away with it, and it's hard to do, it's really good to avoid doing any sort of public pricing until you've actually set the price in the market. You know, again, this is, this is very much a personal narrative, but like over three product launches and you know, billions of dollars of revenue for early market situations, the only way I've actually been able to find price is through the sales motion. Like no amount of market research or comp analysis in my experience will do it. Like you don't know what people are willing to pay and they don't know what they're willing to pay until you've really shown the value. And the time that you've shown the value, you've already de-risked the account, you've de-risked technical risk, you've de-risked organizational risk. So this is like a year-long engagement cycle before like you actually know what they're willing to pay for these things. The more that you can actually protect whatever the Mark's notion of pricing is until you get to where they're actually willing to pay, the better. It's not always possible, but I don't think we ever listed pricing. I mean, I think it was probably five years in before we actually started listing pricing. Marketing was almost like a pejorative when I, you know, when I was doing my PhD. They would say sales and marketing without even knowing what either meant. What I've come to appreciate is, um, A, marketing is incredibly technical, and it's becoming exceptionally technical as developers become a buying center. It's actually also one of the, the best moats you can build around your company, so I think it's something to really invest in. Um, I just want to kind of describe marketing because it means so many things to different people. When I think about marketing, I think of it in three terms. There's product marketing, which it does two functions, like what's your story and sales enablement. So like my product marketing team, you find like the repeatable sale, you train the sales team. Demand gen, which is kind of field marketing, which is okay. You've got the entire world, reduce it to a set of people that I can chase after, right? Throw stuff in the top of funnel. And then branding, which I'm not going to talk about branding because that's an art that I actually don't understand. And we never got right. The thing about being an entrepreneur, especially an early entrepreneur, is like in the very beginning, the only currency you have is magic beans. Like you have nothing else. Like that's everything, right? It's like this story that you have for entrepreneurs, that story you have for investors, for early employees, for early, like you have nothing else, right? You've got like four other people, you don't have a product, and if you do, it doesn't work. All you really have, and the problem with like these magic beans is 
you're really used to them because you live with them all the time, so you know why they're super awesome, but nobody else does, and you normally only have about 10 minutes to tell other people why they're so awesome, right? I mean, so you're putting everything into this level of currency, but it's got to be as simple as simple as possible. We probably spent six months just refining the story of value. I mean, six months. And it was like six months of every day. And, you know, it's because I was the technical guy, I came in, and I'm like, this is why it's awesome. <laughs> it was enormous. Positioning and story is sacrifice, right? You're sitting there, it's this triage, and it's just kind of this grueling thing because you're cutting up parts of your body, but then you end up with something that's actually meaningful. So the only takeaway I want you to have from this slide is like, it is your currency early on. You will use it, you know, you will continue to refine it, and it has to be simple. So invest a lot in it. I find people really underappreciate this until much, much later, how powerful it is to have a very, very consistent internal story. Tell you a little bit about marketing channels. In my experience, feed on the street, whether it's you, it's your sales teams, or somebody talking to customers is the primary channel for dissemination in early markets. Like you can write articles, they very rarely create concepts in people's brains and they very rarely create value. You can do press, it's fine, but I've found press better for like recruiting in the early days than, than like market category creation. Analysts actually are very important. It's interesting. Like when you're dealing with like the early adopters, like the first adopters, they don't really listen to analysts because they're often like kind of wild west and they'll engage with you directly. But as soon as you go down market, like Gartner is really important. And it takes actually a long time. I mean, believe it or not, you have to do like your own market category creation with Gartner. I always thought it was really ironic, right? Like the first time you talk to Gartner about your idea, they don't know that it exists. So it's like this kind of mini assault that you have to do in order to get them to get it to agree, and then they'll affect buying motions down. So I think one of the most significant changes that's happening in all of the enterprise is that developers control budget. In the past, for enterprise sales motion, like, and I actually think the power and the moat of all the incumbents, like IBM and Cisco and Oracle, they own the accounts. And when I mean own, I mean own. They've trained all the people there, right? They own the channel partners that go in there. They have all the certifications there. They've got account relationships that go back 40 years, and they've got 500 people in the account. I mean, they, they own it, right? And that's been one of the most difficult things for startups to overcome. If you're doing a startup in the enterprise space to actually find out a way to like break into that, that's been kind of the challenge. All of that's changing right now because developers are influencing budget more than ever. And they're changing in a way that's really beneficial to you. That's changing in a way that they're way more technical. They don't care about these relationships. They like to consume things on kind of more of an Amazon-like basis. They actually don't care as much about analysts. You know, they definitely don't have like the same relationships with the box seats or the nice dinners or whatever. I mean, it's a very, very different buyer. So I think it's like the best time ever in enterprise infrastructure to build a startup company. And actually, I think in enterprise in general, because there's such a big change that's going on. The problem is, is nobody knows really how to get to them. There's this kind of old adage, you know, how do you invest in a consumer company? Well, if you're doing a consumer company, you don't really know if the technology is going to work. I mean, you assume the technology is going to work, but you don't know if it's going to take off. Who knows what, you know, millennials in Europe like type thing, right? And so what you would normally do is you just wait until it took off and then you would invest. And in the enterprise, you're like, listen, we can just talk to the enterprise customer and we can look at the technology. But the developers are changing that, right? We're all trying to figure out what excites developers. And here's what most people will tell you. You can do freemium, you can do hackathons. Like, and I'm not sure if any of that works. We've gone through probably 200 companies that have tried these things. And like, you'll see three open source projects that do roughly the same thing. One takes off, one doesn't take off. So I don't want you to take away that this is what you do to attract developers. But I will say that if you track developers, you have something. That is something that has influence with an organization as long as you don't you know, run into the other pitfalls, which unfortunately, there are a few. But, you know, there are companies that have been very, very successful getting developers with open source or doing meetups or doing freemiums. I mean, all of these things have been successful. I don't know if that's correlative or causative. And so I don't want to kind of go on for any of those. Just because you have a lot of developers that like your thing doesn't mean you're done. Developer budgets tend to be very fragmented and small low consumption, not long relations. Often, like when you get to the larger budgets, you've got to deal with procurement anyways. And so the way that we have seen, and this, again, nothing I say is categorical. In general, when we have seen companies come in that have open source strategies that create large top of funnels for developers, you get nice, super linear revenue ramps to 100 million plus once they build direct sales. And that goes back to the discussion we had previously of that's the way you get the ACV that you need to drive real penetration. And then this is where you get the, the much larger deals, the much larger CAC, and you can actually grow out direct sales team. I mean, the reason I put this up is I don't want you to like say, oh, I've, I've got developers, I should sell them in the right model. 
you should think very seriously if you can still build out a direct sales to sell to other parts of the organization like core IT. Because I would say the majority of the successful companies we see, that was the model they did. The open source thing people love, sell to core IT on the operation side. I think a very, very common mistake and one that I made many times is to think that sales is sales. Early market sales is very, very different than mature market sales. And the people that do well in early market sales are often very, very different than people that do well in mature market sales. And the reason is it's just a very different motion. In mature markets, the customer is already educated, right? They already know about the widget. They already know about the competitive landscape. They already know about the risk profile, right? I mean, it's like they know what's going to happen. And so it's much more of a relationship commercials type discussion. It doesn't really matter to talk about technology because you only talk about technology when it's like being created. Other than that, it's just a mechanism, right? Where in early market sales, it's technology-led. You've got to qualify <laughs> really hard, you know, you've got to be a renaissance. I mean, like, it's a very, very different motion. And as an entrepreneur, I had no idea how to, like, when I was recruiting, like, listen, I, the company was started as me, and then, you know, I hire everybody, and, like, so I'm hiring these people. I have no idea how to actually hire a salesperson for an early market. So I find this very useful. I think you should look it up. It's called a sales learning curve. Like, I actually don't like these kind of general frameworks, but this one I really like, and it just gives you a very simple mental model. As markets mature... A single sales head in the early days won't even break even. So let's say their OTE is 300K or whatever, they'll be less. One way to know if you're still in an early market is if you think you've got product market fit, you feel like you do, the market's maturing, but you're hiring sales folks and are not breaking even. The types of sales leaders that you want at this time, very self-initiated, like understand how to use an SE, a sales engineer, often know how to pull in multiple parts of a sale, multiple parts of an organization qualify very aggressively. It's a very specific time. Some people call them hunters. You can call them whatever you want. Whereas at some point, you get more productivity in a rate until we get to about, say, two to three times OTE, you've hit a mature market. And then you've got very much coin-operated numbers, sales folks that will really get out there and hustle and drive sales. At some point in time, you actually have to shift your sales organization. And sometimes, you know, like with a really good sales leader, they'll do that shift for you. Like they know how to manage the team, you know, they'll do the training and everything else. In our case, we had to do a reset. Like it was like, it's not fun, right? So definitely know that there's a different skill set early and later. One of the most disruptive things in a startup, in my experience, you, you built out your sales team because you're really excited because you got one customer win and like a lot of people are talking about you and you hit Hacker News and all this other stuff. You got the sales team and then all of a sudden like they're not hitting quota and they're frustrated. And then all of a sudden you've got something that's starting for auction that is going to like reach into your organization. And like now they're pushing on the engineering and the PM to get like the one thing to get the deal. They're pulling in the wrong types of deals. They're not qualified customers. By my second sales team, I found that like in the early days, actually doing cash-based comp isn't always the best thing because they'll find a way to get it. And that's not always the best way to get market signaling and market feedback. So do whatever you can to survive and only turn things on once you really feel like you've got product market fit. Because something, honestly, that's worse than having no sales team and no numbers is, is a sales team that's starting for oxygen, just because they can be so disruptive, not only to morale, but to internals of the organization. And you really start missing market signaling just because they're looking for anything that they can to get something in. Sales reps, account manager, account exec, account rep, whatever you want to call it. In early markets, often the, the sale is done by sales engineer. It's actually, actually doing the sale and getting it to technical close. So normally what happens is like, the account rep will find and qualify a deal. The sales engineer will actually bring it to technical close. The actual selling is like actually on a technical side. Mature market sales engineers often are like good at pox and demos and integration. They look more like a support type resource where early market is an evangelical sales. It's almost like a mini CTO. And then uh, the ISR. Typical sales engagement model, just so you know, introductory, so you do proof of concept, maybe a pilot, then you get to technical close. If at all possible, don't talk about pricing until here in, in early market. And the reason is, is there's no way they can actually value your solution because they've never thought about before until you get to technical close. And so it's a very difficult thing to do. Customers are very trained to talk about pricing early on. So I think this is one of the most important slides for early sales, which is actually your limiting resources, not often what you think about it is. Your limited resources are often your startup capacity. Entrepreneurs are like a little deluded and like, like super smart about an area and they know everything and they spend their entire lives like becoming these libraries of a space and that is so valuable to any buyer. So they'll super happily listen to you and even pay you 50K here, 100K there to learn from you. 
you can glue trap in an account for years without getting a real deal. And like what you're really doing is you're really burning your internal capacities to address their need. Another thing that large buyers will often do is actually turn into a contract engineering shop. And, like, and it, all, it often looks like, wow, if I just put this one more feature, then you know, I'm going to have like this you know, big, huge account. But unless like, you're working towards a repeatable product and market, you're contract engineering. If there's one kind of like, how do I think about early sales motion? I think qualification is critical. And here's many of the mistakes that can happen if you don't do that. So professional services. So this is kind of a non-VC thing to say, but I want to point it out. So what are professional services? So professional services, if you're, if you're going and you're selling to a customer, and they're like, oh, listen, will you, you know, take 300K to actually help implement and do professional services? Now, the standard from like kind of VC logic is, well, you don't do that because they're low-margin, shitty businesses. I mean, that's generally what you hear. In early markets, though, sometimes it's required, and it's required for two reasons. The first one is the customer wants to pay you that money because they want that assurance. It's not unusual for a pre-CASM enterprise product to have 50% license and 50% professional services. Now, VCs will hate it, investors will hate it, because they're like, oh, this is a big, low-margin business. But actually, to get the deal done and to actually implement it correctly and to offload that cost, it's required. But what's even more important, I think less talked about, is ultimately, that professional service, especially for complex products, has to happen sometime. Right? Like somebody's got to do it. Either the customer does it or the partner ecosystem does it. The ideal case is the partner ecosystem does it. But most partner ecosystems you can't incent without actually having a market. Like they're not going to train all their folks and get them all ready to do PS for like a non existent PS market. So many companies that we've tracked is like they'll actually do PS, they'll actually take money for professional services. And yes, they take it all on license, they build a market, and then they will offload that to the partner ecosystem once you have a real market to do that. So I think one of the, another one of the most seductive thoughts to, a, to a, a startup is like indirect sales. And I think it's one of the biggest mistakes as well. I'll put it in the top five. And that's the following. It's like, I've got a new product. I don't understand. Go to market. HP will sell it for me. Or IBM will sell it for me or whoever. Here's my experience. The channel, a reseller, an OEM, a VAR reseller, will only work in a pull-based market. Like, if you're in a pre-market situation, they just can't do it. It requires too much evangelism. They don't know it. It requires too much training. Yes, if you're doing kind of a data domain type thing where you're, you're, you're entering an existing market, you can do it. But the channel in general won't work until it matures. So it's worth investing in it for when it does mature. It won't drive your number. I know very few cases, almost none, where the channel kicked in early. And most entrepreneurs I work with want to engage the channel early because it just feels like kind of like a shortcut. And it doesn't happen. So in the final couple minutes, if you have a technical background in particular or product background in particular, all companies come down to go to market. That's basically the company. I went from like, you know, like I wrote code, then I like ended up like just maintaining the make system. And then I basically had PNL for the entire organization. That was the entire organization. Like R&D really does pencil out as, as a fixed cost. And it really is what drives the business. So like understand it. And it's really important that you do. Story is critical, overinvest in that. I do think that if you're selling into a pre-market situation, if you can do direct sales, you should. I just think you should. I think it's like an ISR is great for top of funnel and ISR is like inside sales is great to kind of get things going. But I think you need to have a plan to get to direct sales. Figure out this stuff as much as you can beforehand, especially with pricing, because otherwise you're going to cannibalize yourself before you get started. It'd be great for the channel to save you, but it's unlikely to. So with that, thank you.